We are now joined by Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Fauci, thank you for joining us this morning. I want to begin with that new research uh, showing that the COVID-19 may have been circulating in New York far earlier than people thought mid-February, and that most of the cases came from Europe. What's your assessment of those studies? Well, I think that's probably correct, George, because, you know, when you had the situation that uh, Europe became the epicenter pretty quickly after China really exploded with their cases. As you know, we cut off the uh, travel from China relatively early, and we were seated with a relatively few number of cases from China. But very quickly, the epicenter switched to Europe, particularly northern Italy. And given the, the travel and the air traffic from anywhere in Italy, but also particularly northern Italy, it's just not surprising that unfortunately and inadvertently New York was seated before they really knew what was going on. And that's why they're in the difficult situation that they're in right now. A very unfortunate situation. Boy, it, it sure is. And how about those new models now showing that the projected death tolls in the United States could be far lower than we previously thought, maybe about 60,000 rather than 90 or 100,000? Yeah, that, that, that's obviously good news, George. You know, as I've always said, you, you give models to try and help you project, such as the need for beds, the needs for ventilators, et cetera. But the models are only as good as the assumptions that you put into the model. And one of the assumptions was, I believe, that there'd be a certain degree of efficacy of the mitigation, the kinds of things we're doing right now that New York is doing intensively. And so when you get new data, the data always trumps the model. So you have to take your data and then refashion the model. And that's what's happened. We've gone from 100,000 to 200,000 down to about 60. That's the good news. What we need to do is to make sure we don't let up on those mitigation, those physical separation programs. Because if we do, that can just bounce back again. So even though it's good news and encouraging, we've got to make sure, as I always say, we keep our foot on the accelerator when it comes to the mitigation. So people who look at these numbers and say, we're gonna be relaxing the guidelines come May 1st with about three weeks to go, what's your message to them? My message is that the virus itself is gonna determine the guideline. We hope that by the time we get to this extended 30-day period, you know, we went from the 15 days of mitigation to the, to the additional 30 days, which gets us to the end of April. I do hope by the time we get there, that we will well see that curve and in, in that, that bending in the curve, which we've been talking about now for several weeks. There's some indication that that might be going on, particularly in New York. If you look at New York, as, Mayor, as Governor Cuomo said very recently, the last few days have had a stabilization and a decrease in the hospitalizations, intensive care, and the need for intubation. You never want to you know, claim victory prematurely. That would be not very good. But when you see those kind of trends, you hope that we'll see that curve go down and then we could start to think about gradually getting back to some sort of steps towards normality. Have we hit the peak in New York? It's tough to tell, George. We're, it, we, we very well may be there. You know, when you talk about peak, it goes up, it does this, and then it starts to come down. It's really looking like it's gonna make that turn. But you know, being very careful, <laughs> and cautiously optimistic. I wouldn't want to say that, but I think that is what is going on. There had been some hope that uh, early on that maybe the virus recedes with warmer, more humid weather. Where is the science on that now? You know, there, you should not assume, George, that the virus is going to diminish because of the coming of the warm weather. It might diminish for other reasons. There's precedent with other infections like influenza and some of the common, more benign coronavirus is that when the weather gets warmer, that the virus goes down, its ability to replicate, to spread. It doesn't like warm, moist weather as much as it likes cold, dry weather. But having said that, one should not assume that we are going to be rescued by a change in the weather. You must assume that the virus will continue to do its thing. If we get some help from the weather, so be it fine. But I don't think we need to assume that. Finally, let's talk a little bit about the new normal after this crisis passed. Handshaking not going to be part of the new normal? You know, I, I, I think at least for a while, George, as I've said, you know, people have kind of raised their eyebrows when I said it. I think we should refrain from that right now because we really need to concentrate on the physical separation. But also, even as you get back to normal, continue to wash your hands because with viral diseases that are respiratory born, 
where people continue to touch their face and then shake hands and touch doorknobs. To me, the better part of valor is just hold off on that for a while. Dr. Fauci, thanks for your time this morning. Always good to be with you, George. Always such good information from Dr. Fauci. And Michael, I don't know about you. I'm willing to live with elbow bumps for a long time. Yeah, I'm willing to just do it away, George, from six feet away <laughs> for quite a while as well. Well, hey there, GMA fans. Robin Roberts here. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Lots of great stuff here. So go on, click the subscribe button right over, right over here to get more of awesome videos and content from GMA every day, anytime. We thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the morning on GMA. For everyone glued to the news as updates come in on the spread of the coronavirus, Dr. Anthony Fauci is quickly becoming a familiar face in the American living room, one that seems to bring comfort and reassurance not only to the American people, but to the president himself. According to the Washington Post, Fauci is an immunologist, a scientist who studies the body's defenses, and head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. In light of the coronavirus pandemic, Fauci has been called by the White House to work on the coronavirus task force. Fauci is such a familiar presence these days that the hashtag where is Fauci spikes on the rare occasions the doctor is not present at the White House press briefings, according to Heavy. He's been married to his wife, Christine Grady, for 35 years. According to the Journal of Clinical Investigation, the couple met in 1983 and tied the knot in 1985. Grady is the chief of the Department of Bioethics at the National Institutes of Health Clinical Center. In an interview with the Financial Times in 2015, Fauci talked about Grady with pride, calling her a triple threat. He said, She went to school to get her PhD in philosophy, worked, and had three children. We met over the bed of a patient. In April 2010, President Obama appointed Dr. Grady to the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues, where she became the chief of the Department of Bioethics at the National Institutes of Health Clinical Center, according to the archived blog for the 2009 to 2017 Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethics ethical issues. As of April 2020, Grady, who is 67, worries about her 79-year-old husband and his busy schedule, especially now. Grady told CNBC's Make It, I try to get him to rest, to drink water, to eat well, to sleep, and to be selective about what he agrees to and say no to some things. Fauci and his wife have three daughters, and they grew up in Washington, D.C. According to her LinkedIn profile, their oldest daughter, Jennifer, a Harvard graduate, earned a master's degree in 2013 in developmental and child psychology from Columbia University, followed by a doctorate in counseling psychology from Boston College. Their second daughter, Megan, went to Johns Hopkins University, where she was pre-med, according to Heavy, but has since moved to New Orleans, where she works as a teacher. Their third daughter, Alex, Allison went to Stanford University and majored in computer science. She competed on the rowing team where she had great success for the four years she attended, according to her Stanford bio. After she graduated in 2014, she took a job at Twitter where she works as a software engineer, according to her LinkedIn profile. In the Journal of Clinical Investigation, a biographical portion in the article summed up Fauci's relationship with his family, saying, Fauci is phenomenally devoted and especially proud of his family, whom in my opinion, gives him more satisfaction than anything else in life. Working at President Donald Trump's side during the coronavirus pandemic, Fauci has gained national recognition as one of the few people who publicly corrects him. No one is going to want to tone down things when you see what's going on in a place like New York City. I mean, I mean that's just, you know, good public health practice and common sense. As Fauci becomes more of a public figure with each White House briefing, there are also safety risks for the doctor. The Washington Post pointed out, security concerns for Fauci include threats as well as unwelcome communications from fervent admirers. The news outlet also noted that Fauci has become the target of some right-wing spokespeople who claim that he's a, quote, agent of the deep state and blame him for the president's restrictions. According to the Washington Post, the Department of Health and Human Services asked the U.S. Mar Marshal Service to provide protection for Fauci. An HHS spokesperson stressed that Fauci is an integral part of the U.S. government's coronavirus response, which is undoubtedly why it is so important that he stay safe and healthy. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Nicki Swift videos about your favorite celebs are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.
Joining us now is Dr. Anthony Fauci. He is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and a member of the White House Coronavirus Task Force and one of the busiest men alive. We so appreciate your time, Dr. Fauci. Thank you for being here. Good to be with you. Let's start with the antibody tests. Um, I've heard you say that they have been, some have been developed and even validated. Are we really just days away from them being in use? Yes, actually, at the last task force meeting, the, the individuals responsible for, for both developing, validating, and getting the test out are saying, and, it, and I'm certain that that's going to happen, that within a period of a week or so, we're going to have a rather large number of tests that are available. One of the things that you mentioned that's important because other countries have gotten burned by this, these antibody tests are tests that we do on other diseases but they need to be validated. You need to make sure that they're consistent and that they're accurate. And that's what we're doing now, both with the NIH and with the FDA, is validating them. As soon as they get validated, they'll be out there for people to use. And so, Dr. Fauci, <clears throat> does that mean, what does that mean for us? Does that mean that we are shifting away from an emphasis in testing for coronavirus to antibody testing to see who has had it and recovered? No, not at all. I mean, th those things are done in parallel. One does not uh, essentially rule out the other. We still rely appropriately and heavily on the test to show that someone is in fact infected. Whereas the antibody test says that you were infected and if you're feeling well, you very likely recovered. When you're trying to find out whether a person is infected, that's the test we always talk about. But as we look forward, as we get to the point of at least considering opening up the country as it were, it's a very important to appreciate and to understand how much that virus has penetrated the society. Because it's very likely that there are a large number of people out there that have been infected, have been asymptomatic, and did not know they were infected. If their antibody test is positive, mm -hmm. one can formulate kind of strategies about whether or not they would be at risk or vulnerable to getting reinfected. This would be important for healthcare workers, for first-line fighters, mm -hmm. those kinds of people. Can you imagine a time where Americans carry certificates of immunity? You know, um, th that's possible. I mean, it's one of those things that we talk about uh, when we want to make sure that we know who the vulnerable people are and not. Uh, this is something that's being discussed. I think it might actually be have some merit under certain circumstances. Okay. Um, I want to talk about something else that we understand is being discussed among the task force and in the White House, and that is when to reopen the country. The president is eager to do so, as he has said. He's even eyeing the date of May 1st. Um, who is going to oversee that? Is there someone who is coordinating the plan for reopening the country? Yes, uh, th that's a very good question. You know, it isn't a single person. As you know, the task force meets every single day, uh, studies all the data that come in. There's also a group that's looking at what the best approach would be from the standpoint of the kinds of people that you'd want to get out there first, the people who are very necessary to the functioning of society. At the end of the day, we have FEMA involved. We have Dr. Debbie Burks, who is the coordinator within the task force. And we go over the data on a day-by-day -day basis, and we report it to the president and the vice president. That that decision will be made at that level. Are you comfortable with the date of May 1st? <clears throat> well, as I've said so many times, Allison, that uh, the virus kind of decides whether or not it's going to be appropriate to open or not. What we're seeing right now are some favorable signs, as I've discussed with you a few times on this show. It's looking like that in many cases, particularly in New York, we're starting to see a flattening and a turning around. We would want to see, I would want to see, a clear indication that you are very, very clearly and strongly going in the right direction. Because the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to get out there prematurely and then wind up your back back in the same situation. So obviously we're looking for the kinds of things that would indicate that we can go forward in a gradual way to essentially reopen the country to a more normal way. But that would really depend upon a number of things that we really, really follow every day. Mm -hmm. um, we are, of course, are on the cusp of a holiday weekend, um, Easter, 
Sunday is when so many people um, get together and have big family dinners. What is your message to the country and for people who are feeling a little bit better and maybe more confident and might be tempted to do that? Yeah. Yes, thank you for asking that question. I mean, as, as, as difficult as it is, we must continue to adhere to the mitigation strategies of physical separation that are in those guidelines that were first 15 day, now they're extended for the 30 days till the end of April. Uh, appreciating, I know, particularly in a season like the Easter season and Passover, how difficult that is. But we really need to do it because it is working. The kinds of mitigations that we're doing now, the curves that we're seeing flattening and coming down, that's exactly and precisely because of what the American public is doing. So even though we're in a holiday season, now is no time to back off. As I say so often, now is the time to actually put your foot on the accelerator because we're going in the right direction. Let's keep in that direction. Are the models that you're looking at still predicting Easter Sunday being the peak of this in terms of deaths in the country? Well, as we said last weekend, as we're going into this weekend, that this is going to be a really bad week. And unfortunately, but predictably, it was a bad week with regard to deaths. But as I've said many times, deaths tend to lag behind what the driving elements of the outbreak are, namely the new cases that are coming into the system. So at the end of this week, we'll look back and say, that was really a bad week when it comes to deaths. But on the other side of that week, in the beginning, as we're seeing, particularly in New York, New York is a really good example. At the time that day where their, their deaths peaked, they were seeing less hospitalizations, less admissions, less need for intubations. So it was really the way we predicted that the deaths would clearly lag behind the favorable parameters of what's going on. Dr. Fauci, in our waning seconds with you, and on a much lighter note, <clears throat> Saturday Night Live is back this weekend. After a month of being off, what do you think the chances are that somebody will portray you? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they did, who, which actor would you want to play you? Um, here are some suggestions that I've heard. Ben Stiller, Brad Pitt. Which one? <laughs> oh, Brad Pitt, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's fitting. Um, Dr. Fauci, we really appreciate your time. We know how busy you are. Thank you very much for all of the information. It's always good to be with you. Thank you. You too. As many have said, one of the keys to reopening the country may be testing for antibodies to see if Americans have been exposed to the virus and if they might have some immunity. It would certainly offer some reassurance as families decide if it's safe to go back to work. Tonight, we're with the researchers with an experimental test checking for antibodies, a simple pinprick. But can the federal government, do they have the ability to get tens of millions of these tests ready and quickly? What they said about that today. Here's ABC's Kaylee Hartung tonight. Tonight on the front lines of a key battle in the fight to get America back to work. A line of people in Northern California waiting for an antibody test to determine whether they've been exposed to the coronavirus without knowing it and may now be immune. The key to reopening is going to be testing. The antibody testing in California, part of a USC Stanford study, requires just a drop of blood, a simple pinprick. They say it costs about 10 bucks and results are available in about 10 minutes. $10, 10 minutes per test. And you are gathering incredibly valuable information. We can do this on a very large scale if we want to. The federal government has yet to deploy a nationwide test. New York State, the epicenter of the crisis, is developing its own, but they're only able to perform a few thousand tests a week. It's not enough if you want to reopen on a meaningful scale and reopen quickly. We need uh, an unprecedented mobilization where government can produce these tests in the millions. Today, Governor Cuomo calling on President Trump to use the Defense Production Act to make private companies produce antibody tests. But today from the White House. There's not a lot of issues with testing. The president has downplayed the need for nationwide testing to diagnose COVID-19 or detect whether a person has had the virus and is now possibly immune. We want to have it and we're going to see if we have it. Do you need it? No. Is it a nice thing to do? Yes. Uh, we're talking about 325 million people. 
uh, and that's not going to happen. But Dr. Anthony Fauci says testing is key and today announced the federal government is closing in on an antibody test. Within a period of a week or so, we're going to have a rather large number of tests that are available. President Trump now making this pledge. We're confident that the production will scale up to tens of millions of tests very quickly. A lot of eyes will be watching to see if that actually comes to fruition. And Kaylee with us tonight, the president, Dr. Fauci, were both asked today, Kaylee, uh, whether Americans might one day have to carry some sort of proof that they have immunity from the virus. Yeah, David, Dr. Fauci was asked if he could imagine that day when Americans would carry around a so-called certificate of immunity. He said it's possible. It's something they're discussing. He says we need to make sure we know the difference between who's still vulnerable to infection and who's not. David. All right, Kaylee Hartung, who has recovered from coronavirus herself, and we're glad to see that, Kaylee. Thanks for reporting tonight. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel, and don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching. A lot of parents are sitting home uh, with their kids, and they've been home with their kids for weeks now, and they're wondering maybe resign to the fact that maybe their kids aren't going back to school this year, but are looking ahead. What do you think summer camp holds and what do you think the start of next school year holds? If you could look down the line, do you think those start on time? Do you think school next year starts on time? Can I say a word on behalf of teachers since I'm married to one? <laughs> there you go. My wife was all day yesterday at the elementary school she teaches at loading up about 500 bins of art supplies for kids. And she's just one of millions of teachers across this country who, who find themselves having to distance teach kids. And uh, I'm proud of Karen, but relatedly, I'm proud of every teacher in this country. Uh, Secretary of Education was here not long ago talking about our efforts to expand distance learning resources, even in K through 12. To all the teachers who are out there, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for what you're doing, for continuing learning even in this challenging time uh, and uh, to all of the kids uh, just because you're home doesn't mean you don't have to do your school work uh, keep it up what i will tell you is I'll, I'll yield to the health experts but that'll be part of what we're looking at in terms of of guidance going forward whether it whether it be summer school uh, or whether it be returning to school next fall but the most important thing we can do is put this epidemic behind us as quickly as possible. Well, my daughter is a school teacher, so she asked me the same, the same question. Um, you know, it, it is unpredictable, but you can get a feel for if we start talking about the things where the curve goes down and we really have minimal, um, how we respond and what kind of a rebound we see or don't see, I think is going to have a lot of influence probably more immediately on things like summer camps than it does in the fall. I fully expect, though I'm humble enough to know that I can't accurately predict, that by the time we get to the fall that we will have this under control enough that it certainly will not be the way it is now where people are shutting schools. My optimistic side tells me that we'll be able to renew to a certain extent, but it's going to be different, remember now, because this is not going to disappear. So we're going to have to have in place the capability of doing the things that we talk about all the time on this stage to identify, to isolate, to contact trace, number one. Number two, by that time, we'll have a better feel with the antibody test about what the actual penetrance of this infection was in society. How many people have actually been infected? Who's protected? If you have antibody, it's very likely that you're protected. Who's vulnerable? Do you treat vulnerables? different than you treat the people who are protected. All of these things are going to go into the decision of just how much back to the original way we'd like it to be in the fall. Bottom line is no absolute prediction, but I think we're going to be in good shape. Knowing the signs, does it make sense to you that some states are still not issuing stay-at-home orders? I don't understand why that's not happening. As you said, you know, the tension between federally mandated versus states' rights to do what they want is something I don't want to get into. But if you look at what's going on in this country, I just don't understand why we're not doing that. We really should be.